Uh, so today, I would like to speak about something very, very important. Uh, the thing is that if you look at the past maybe 10 years, uh, there's been so uh, many organizational changes across the globe. And these changes have to do with uh, brain studies, specifically in the brain studies. And Russia is also part of this uh, movement, let's call it that way. So as president of Russia specifically indicated uh, is the Russian Academy of Scientists you know, stepped in and uh, prepared a dedicated and targeted uh, brain study program. And as you know, uh, it is officially supported by the government and is ready to be uh, implemented. So and I think it is very, very important in this regard to um, a look at the global picture uh, at what's happening in the world and uh, in that regard understand the role of Russia in this global dynamics uh, because of course each uh, prominent country will do its part and I'm absolutely sure that each and every one will have to do something that others have not done and it's very very difficult it's not it's not easy so let's have a look at this process so, uh, speaking of these global brain studies, so uh, this is a United States uh, professor. He said that 60 years ago, students that were trying to be at the forefront of science uh, would become physicists. 30 years ago, they would go into molecular biology, and now they go into neuroscience. Especially guys that don't know what to do in life, they go, okay, neuroscience. Uh, they see it as the forefront. And by the way, many, many, many distinguished science said that uh, the 21st century, that's brain, that's what it's all about. So the brain uh, is uh, the same to the 21st century as the gene was to the 20th century. It's all about the brain studies. The brain studies is taking science to the next level and uh, creates this quantum leap, uh, quantum leap in uh, competitive in competition. By the way, this is President Obama speaking to the Congress, by the way, uh, when the US um, brain study program, brain initiative, when it was launched originally, that's what he said, of course. And you see only some of the programs from China, European Union, Japan, Israel, Australia, uh, South Korea, etc. Lots of also international studies, uh, no problem there. And uh, as you know, there's also a special uh, 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 United States session, the, the U, 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 UN session that was also dedicated to this. So the multiple studies and uh, also related to space studies and things like that. So why the brain? Let's talk about the brain. Why is it the brain? And, you know, I would like to quote something that um, is very close to our debate. It's very close to what Natalia is going to have after this session. It's a very, very important thing. So what I'm saying is that, of course, we're talking about health because every uh, every every third or every fourth person on this world, in this world, has some sort of cognitive dissonance, some sort of cognitive issues on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to our brain, uh, on the one hand, we study the brain, the, by the chemistry of the brain. Uh, we uh, study certain um, elements, uh, things uh, that on their own don't have cognition. But uh, at least uh, for the past several centuries, we know that it's the brain and not the heart. It's where we have the cognition, that we have creativity, moral values, ethics, aesthetics, creativity, freedom of choice. Uh, etc. And uh, whether it's banks, money, economy, presidents, etc., all that comes from cognition. So this gap, uh, this gap uh, between the, the, the uh, this, this gap is called explanatory gap, because there's the body and there's the mind, right? So uh, from physics, biology and chemistry to sociology, anthropology and psychology. And we still have this gap. So basically we live in one world. There's no two worlds. Essentially it's the united one world. If you go, it's like if you stop a person on the street and ask like, oh, do you have the brain? Do you have the mind or just the body? 
What do you think people will say? Well, so ah, probably both. Yes, and also, well, also have a soul, but that there's no, there's nothing is separate. So we need to close this explanatory gap because it's all together. So Francis Crick, uh, for the past 25 years, Francis Crick has been a great scholar of the brain. And he said multiple times that uh, in terms of uh, the uh, humanity, it's not really about treating any particular disease, uh, even though it's important, but it's about understanding the true nature of the soul. As Francis Crick said that, so it's a more holistic approach. So I believe that these kind of studies, understanding the connection between the mind and the brain will have a far going, far reaching consequences. And look, uh, once we understand, fully understand what brain and mind is, the level of our cognitive capabilities will switch and just go to the next level and a lot of the things in this world will also be different so how come that so many countries are now jump, jump jumping on this bandwagon and uh, doing all these studies uh, the thing is that there's been a revolution and this revolution actually happened uh, in the brain studies uh, just from a technology standpoint so here at the bottom you see a different methods this is a time continuum and this is what we had uh, back in the 80s so and you see different technologies that's being used and every method of course has its power over time and space and uh, you have 30 years ago and you have today so uh, these are the same authors it's the same article but uh, you see 2000 <clears throat> so 80s versus 2014 you see look at how many different technologies have been born had been born over these 30 years and uh, this just opens the door uh, it's an unprecedented unprecedented uh, capability that we've never had in the past so and this opens up of course tremendous uh, opportunities so i uh, no wonder that uh, so many countries are now competing in uh, this kind of studies and trying to uh, be at the forefront uh, of this brain studies uh, be it the united states or european union or china or korea and uh, the Europe, that's of course the Human Brain Project. Um, uh, everybody knows this Human Brain Project, and uh, also in the United States, the U.S. Brain Initiative was also announced that in 2014. Uh, so a Japanese brain study joined it. Israel Brain Technologies also joined in, and um, to, uh, in 2016, uh, Korea joined in so and uh, received government funding the korean brain initiative and then australian brain alliance and then the china brain project that is currently being funded and of course a whole <clears throat> a litany of other international programs so you have this international brain laboratory you have international brain initiatives canada brain research so the brain race is on it says it is true because it's, it is indeed a brain race and uh it's a very very powerful brain and um the original ideologist uh, from the European part, um, as you know, uh, just shows the, just how much is being done and how much is being invested. So HB, HBP is a flagship program, one point, almost like 1.2 billion euros. Uh, this is a multi-year program. It's neuroinformatics, medical information, uh, so brain simulation, so high-performance computing, uh, neuromorphic computing, neurobiotics, and whatnot, etc. So it's a powerful, powerful program that's going to run for 10 years. Um, so, so uh, like I said, uh, it's a very, very powerful initiative. So, so many things to be done. Just look at this. Uh, so you have neuromorphic, neurobotics, ethics in society, etc. So many different things, so many different areas. Uh, so speaking about the brain initiatives in the United States, uh, that's 2014. So it came a year later, after 2013 in, in Europe, and it has a totally different approach. So it was designed uh, during a small conference in the UK uh, that was done by the Recovery Royal Society and Recovery Foundation. So, and it features mostly different professionals 
uh, in nanotechnologies. It was originally a genetic engineering nanotechnology conference. That was just a little bit of neurobiology. So during this uh, boutique conference, they thought that now it is the time to make that quantum leap. So they went to the U.S. state, uh, U.S. Uh, president, uh, but which is Obama at the time. So they came up with this paper. So and the president office started discussion. So they launched this discussion, and I uh, think it took about a year uh, to to get the things done. And then uh, at the end of the year, they announced this initiative. So and that was also followed by. Uh, workshops and conferences so throughout the year some of the leading neuroscientists of the united states uh, participated in this program so the priority of this program is technology so this is a primarily a technology conference a technology initiative but technology not in a traditional sense not in the way we tend to um use uh, in russia so what they mean by technology is technology that enables you to better understand how the brain works there's a new disruptive uh, breakthrough technologies that allow you to have a totally different understanding of how the neuro element of the brain actually works. So the first one. The second one is about the cellular level of brain study. So basically studying the brain uh, across the board not just the cells and not just the cells uh and their comparison so what we know as the brain of course the cells uh, and uh, just like the genes for instance that uh together have the genome so unless you go to the level of genes there's nothing you can do with the genome unless you go to the brain cells there's nothing you can do about the brain so you need to go at the deepest possible level uh, I need to study the minimum building element of the brain to understand the true uh, functioning of the brain. So uh, according to this initiative, as it says, it's all about cellular studies, brain cellular studies, and through that fundamental level, elevate it and understand the highest cognitive function. So understanding how these patterns turn into emotions, perceptions, sensory uh, and this, uh, sensory uh, perception of the world become what we call uh, psyche, right? So there are several seven, seven big areas. So this is a 2025 brain uh, initiative. Uh, so 15 leading brain scientists participated in this. So seven top priorities. One is discovering diversity so to identify and provide an exponential uh, experimental access to the different brain cell types to determine their roles in health and disease. So then second is mapping at multiple scales. Then uh, the brain in action to so produce a dynamic picture of the functioning brain. Fourth is demonstrating causality. So linking brain activity to behavior, such as the, the changing neural circuits dynamics that uh, when changed, uh, produce a different result. Number five is identifying fundamental principles, such as producing conceptual uh, foundations uh, to understand uh, the biological basis of mental health. It's what we lack, by the way, uh, to uh, fully comprehend the highest function, the, 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 the supreme function of the brain six is the advancing human neuroscience such as developing innovative technologies to understand the human brain and treatment of its disorders and the seventh of course from brain initiative to the brain itself which is a fully integrated new technological and conceptual approach to the actual brain okay that's the brain initiative so uh it's very very important to underline the fact that it's a fundamental study in the first place so and uh, uh it's a fully published document you can find it online it's the official paper and uh, says that one of the reasons why we don't understand uh, how the brain actually works and the reason we don't have efficient therapies for brain disease is the fact that we lack just precise knowledge about how the brain actually works so this program is meant to uh tap into this mystery uncovering mechanisms that bind together different processes in the world so from just creating pills and treating specific elements oh by the way chinese program uh speaking of that the chinese they specifically distant themselves from this topic they say no 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 let's study the disease chinese want to study the disease so not everybody in the same boat so it's just a different ideology united states versus china oh there's another brain initiative uh called darpa 
So uh, it's also huge and it has big government funding, uh, but um, uh, it's a lot of that has to do with the military, such as the DARPA and uh, so ARPA. So, and one of the key focuses of DARPA is the neuroengineering system design. It's very really important to understand where we where we're going with that. Uh, and the, uh, they basically focusing on invasive approach and technology, such as stimulating brain through, which is direct invasive application to brain. And one of such programs is called uh, NESD, the Neuroengineering System Design, basically aims to win approval from the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. And within four years, they would like to have a wireless human brain device that can monitor brain activity using 1 million electrodes simultaneously and selectively stimulating up to 100,000 neurons. So basically, they're going to implant a chip, right? And this chip is wireless. So, and it can actually monitor brain activities up to 1,000 neurons. That's the whole point. Um, so anyways, oh, by the way, let's not forget Elon Musk here. So, okay, the Neuralink, this is privately funded, of course, creating a neural lace in a, is the thing that really matters for humanity to achieve symbiosis with machines, right? Yes, Elon Musk, of course, there's also government funding, private funding, etc. But, uh, uh, of course, the neural, Neuralink is a very cool technology. I already have it. They've already done it. So, essentially, uh, they, uh, they have this sewing machine, right, for a minimally invasive neural recording. It's similar to DARPA, but it's a very gentle DARPA. You can call it DARPA Lite. So, it's an invasive technology, but it's almost like a brain sewing machine. As you can see here, so it's a tiny window that they cut in the brain and uh, inject this neural link. Pretty cool. Yes. Uh, what else? The China Brain Project. Let's talk about the China Brain Project. Um, actually, China went a different way. Uh, China says, look, uh, our program is all about it's like a like an airplane an airplane has a body it has wings it has engines i would like to understand the the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 functions of the brain so and china as you know has more of this than any other country monkeys yes they have monkeys more monkeys than anybody so you know that uh the population of uh, monkeys that will be primarily subjects of the studies is similar to the population of uh, the Chinese themselves. There's over more than a billion monkeys in China. Think about it. So it means that China can actually use primates, monkeys, to study their brains. And there are as many monkeys as there are Chinese. So anyways, uh, the point is uh, to all, uh, you know, treat uh, different uh, neurological disease and China says look we have the most neurological and uh, other related diseases in the world China says that we have the biggest database and the most data uh, because uh, we, we, we therefore we have the most material than any other country in the world I would like to tap into this uh, brain inspired technologies uh, and artificial intelligence are also part of this okay so it's one body and two wings so building the core and developing the applications. And there's also Australian program, the great mission of our time, Australian Brain Alliance. And there's also the Korean one. And they all sort of go along the same lines. Yes, are uh, all studying the higher sort of higher brain functions and things like that. Uh, some private initiatives like big companies like Google, Facebook, uh, IBM, uh, Neuralink, of course, uh, cognitive computing, uh, Google with the Google Brain, Facebook with the Neuralink, etc. So lots of initiatives. And these are big, big money. So you can look at the numbers here. So uh, why am I saying that? So the reason I'm saying is that uh, these programs are the coordinated because there's the so-called Global Brain Initiative, there's the International Brain Initiative or Global Brain Initiative, the multiple, multiple countries part of it. 
So in, the, in, in 2016, it was launched officially in New York during the uh, United States General Assembly. Uh, by the way, the president of the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, um, during the uh, uh, supervisory council and actually and um, actually talked to the president of Russia and uh, on behalf of the Academy of Sciences and the Moscow State University. So, uh, so uh, the idea was to create the same program in Russia. And the president of Russia supported it. And within literally days, within days, uh, uh, you can see it uh, here. It's a snapshot from the timeline of the human brain process. Russian initiative, Russian President Vladimir Putin said that uh, the human brain research project will be supported by the state. Voila. Uh, and basically since April of 2019 and all the way to April 2020, uh, we've been working very specifically at the Academy of Sciences as a big team a team from different walks of life so we've been together working on this big federal project so the program is ready and in april we submitted it to the government so uh and uh as we speak uh, they are discussing its future development and look russia is a huge legacy here uh so russia used to have by the way the best and uh the probably the most extensive brain studies program by the way russia uh if you go back in time i mean throughout the mankind russia has always been probably on the forefront of brain studies it actually started with uh Mikhail Sechin. As you know, the Sachin, the founding father of neuro, no, neuro of neuro studies, and he was the first, uh, the first one to study it, and he uh, did a lot. Uh, you can see the snapshot from this old paper. That's 1863, of course. Uh, then, of course, the Pavlov School. Everybody knows Pavlov. Uh, this is Pavlov, by the way, is a famous physiologist, uh, speaking during the World uh, Congress of Physiologists in 1935 in Moscow. So, and that was, uh, and uh, see the stats, by the way, in 2015, we only had 24 physiological laboratories, but in uh, only 40 uh, citations per year. But in 1935, we had 388 laboratories and 700 citations. So think about it. Almost a century ago, Russia was like a powerhouse. Pretty incredible. So the International Association, International Brain Research Organization, IBRA, uh, was initiated uh, in 1958 in the United States. Uh, in, sorry, in in the Soviet Union, uh, in, in Soviet Union, basically, right. And at the same time, in 1960, another organization is also international program called Interbrain. Uh, that for the 30 years, all the way to the breakdown of the Soviet Union in 1990, actually. Uh, uh, was uh, collaborating uh, with multiple other countries. So there's 24 countries that's been involved in this initiative called Interbrain. It's a huge, huge program that's been studying everything from brain evolution to studies and togenesis and uh, different species all the way to higher brain activities, uh, so such as language, speech, uh, uh, psychological pathologies and things like that. So it's a big, big initiative. So that's what I'm saying this Russia had tremendous legacy. Uh, but at this day and age, uh, we, of course, has been talking to the government many, many times about uh, the, <laughs> the representatives of the Academy of Science. Condition because Russia has a tremendous legacy. It would be a shame to lose it. And uh, this is the future. This is the future. This is what we need. So no other country. Uh, and it's a crime to actually miss out on this opportunity. This is the first letter that we... Uh, so wrote so this is myself uh and uh Sergeyev as well this is a joint letter but unfortunately only 13 years uh later so we now finally have this initiative 13 years to persuade the government so it's the of uh, the finance is the publications uh is the instruments and it's the people we are lacking behind across the board yes we have a tremendous legacy but in terms of the state of things unfortunately russia is far behind so uh, the United States, China, so these guys actually started and 
ironically, when the Soviet Union was breaking down, it was the 90s where the breakthrough started to happen. So we missed out naturally on a lot of these things. We missed out on the funding, we missed out on the technology, we missed out on a lot of these things. All right, just, just look at the society. The United States, over 50,000 scientists. China, over 5,000 scientists. Russia, only 500 scientists. Just think about it. In the United States, we have, they have dozens of universities, dozens of think tanks, and hundreds of graduates on the neuroscience. In Russia, basically a couple of dozens, maybe 12, 10, 12 people per year. That's the most that we give a year. So, of course, we have the high school economy, some other things, uh, but it's nothing. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drop in the sea. And Russia needs to do a lot more. We have some initiatives in Kazan, for instance, and in Moscow, but it's nothing. It's just not even in the same league. And if you look at neuroscience alone, for instance, like every single year, every single year, 8,000 students graduate, 8,000 students graduate in the United States. Uh, if you look at the number of scientists, it's even more staggering. So the neuro, the neuro society is over 50,000 members in the United States. In Russia, only 500. So that's the people. Now, the technology depends on the funding, of course. So 40 units versus one unit in Russia. Think about it. So or the M so X-ray functional M so like special specialty MRI machines. Uh, they're not clinical, but research. In the United States, uh, they have over 124 of them are state-of-the-art. In Russia, none. So, and only two regular ones. Uh, or multi-photonic microscopy. Um, so, in the United States, they have 63. In Russia, they have three. So, funding. What about funding? Uh, and uh, this uh, tremendous, tremendous amounts. Uh, look at the U.S. Brain Initiative. Look, look at how much they invest versus how much we invest. Now, uh, what about publications, uh, scientific papers? This is. Uh, so according to SGR, I uh, was as far as the neuroscience, Russia is currently on the 26th place. Uh, after Turkey, even Turkey is ahead of us. Okay, what to do? What to do? So, look, uh, when it comes to my own opinion, despite the fact that there's so many uh, studies and uh, publications, we still don't understand the most important thing. So, the main breakthrough is still out there. So we still haven't tapped into the main mystery. This is what was ahead on the second slide. So what is this brain? Uh, how do we think? What is this cognition thing? We don't have the fundamental understanding from the neurological stand of things is how the cognitive function different from everything else. What is the essence of cognition? How is it happening? So where does it come from? Your subjective feelings, sensations, memories, where do they come from? And the reason for John Eccles in this interview, uh, science interview, 1968, more 50 years ago, Ashley, a future Nobel Prize winner, and over 40 years of research, he basically said that you need to be at the ground zero uh, to understand that more than 95% of all research have nothing to do with the theory. It's so rubbish. So it's quantity over quality. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's actually even higher percentage of trash studies. So let's call it that way. There's so many different uh, opinions, so many different uh, conclusions being made. But look, eventually, eventually it's all limited. And I think that we're sort of missing the trees. Uh, in many ways, we're missing the trees behind the woods. And another Nobel Prize winner in 19, 2019 said that we don't have the logics to convert a neural activity into a thought. So we still don't know how it's done. And this is the fundamental issue. So, And this is our chance. This is where we can excel. Uh, this is where the breakthrough can happen. 
So Jim Watson, by the way, uh, a couple of years ago when he was speaking in China, he said that uh, it's an interesting time for neuroscience uh, because the main discovery is still to be done. He said the main discovery is still to be done. So it's an interesting time because it hasn't been made yet. So the key discovery, the main door is still closed. So how do you actually store information in the brain? So that's, that's the holy grail. Right. Not just biological information, cognitive information. How is it stored in the brain? And he says that this is the same as um, uh, the, 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 the way we store information in DNA molecules. Uh, that's incredible. And then he says something that I would like to join. So we don't really know where this discovery will happen, whether it's going to be China or somewhere in the West. But I like the idea, the fact that uh, one or maybe two independent researchers that are not connected to tradition can just come up with it. And this uh, answer will come from cognition, not from trials and errors. Of course, trial and error is important. It's an experimental study, but we need the big idea. We need this big bang. And unless we have the big idea, we don't really know what to do. So, and as he says, I think it's a very, uh, it's a good time for China or for the rest of the non-Western world. Uh, but then he says, uh, this big idea can come from anywhere, even from Russia. So just to recap, this is the final slide. So this is what we need to do, as we believe, this is what we need to do in Russia. So we need to reinforce Russian neurological uh, capacity, especially just to revitalize all this tradition that we've uh, had. Uh, honestly, of course, we need different instruments. We need technology for sure, because we are drastically out of date. Uh, in terms of fundamental studies, uh, we, of course, can also link our studies to physics and mathematics because Russia has always been strong in mathematics and physics. That's where we are toward the force. So we need to collaborate. The neuroscience should it's not of competing, it's sort of isolating. We need to collaborate with the physicists and mathematicians that are world famous from Russia. And uh, uh, it's ideally, of course, we need to also change life sciences. So also the social and humanitarian sciences, just such as, you know, the, in healthcare, for instance, when they tapped into the genome, uh, a lot has changed. So we need uh, to come to collaborate, of course. So uh, STEM sciences and life sciences should, should, should definitely collaborate. And uh, of course, we need to prepare people and uh, we need a fundamental uh, brain studies program similar to the u.s brain initiatives and this russian brain studies program is what we and i myself came up with that's all for me thank you